Thank you, and I'm very aware that I'm the last thing between you and lunch, so um, I don't want to be that person that you're cursing while your tummy is grumbling. So I'm going to try and fly through uh, this presentation, but I did want to make a couple of comments because I have to say, um, as an advocate advocating for reform of Ireland's mental health system, it's been very interesting to hear a number of issues that have been raised this morning and that have prompted questions for me, uh, for sure. I mean, we, we heard uh, uh, this morning from, uh, is it Dr. Farrell, <laughs> Emma, Emma Farrell, um, about the very interesting perspective of young people who have been struggling with their mental health within the education system. And um, I think their insights are, are, are the most important for how we shape and respond um, and provide a system of supports that's effective. But one thing that struck me in that is, um, are, we, are we valuing enough um, the positive aspects of being someone who has a mental health difficulty? We, we, we talk a lot about acceptance, um, about I have to learn to live with this condition. Um, but you know, as someone myself who has lived with panic attacks since I was 16, um, I have to treasure that part of myself as much as I treasure the ways that I've learned to live with panic attacks. So I think that's something to bear in mind. Um, I was really struck throughout the morning by the insights around the power of peer support and the power of helping others. And uh, Daniel, you, you uh, spoke to that very powerfully. But, but throughout the morning, we heard that young people themselves are telling us that by helping other people, that that's part of their own recovery. And so I think we need to, you know, maybe in the next seminar, I would love to hear a lot about how people, young people, are acting as peers, supporting each other through mental health difficulties and how they're learning from each other. Um, we also heard that, um, that young people wouldn't disclose to a prospective employer unless it was absolutely necessary. And um, I think that is a damning indictment still of where we are at in this country in relation to attitudes and in relation to discrimination. And I think we have to ask ourselves if we have an Employment Equality Act that says it's illegal to discriminate against someone with a mental health difficulty, impugned or reality, um, why is it that young people would routinely be saying that they would not want to disclose? What are they afraid of that the law is not protecting them from in this instance? So I think that's a really big question. And that leads me to, to where we're at and, and our perspective. Um, you know, as a mental health reform is the national coalition of organizations that advocates and promotes better mental health services and social inclusion of people with mental health difficulties. Um, we now have 62 member organizations, so we're a very strong coalition that's recognized by government, by the Oireachtas, um, by public agencies as a coordinating voice to promote a better mental health system. Um, but we also have thousands of individuals that are involved with us as activists, as supporters. They're getting involved in our public campaigns, um, or just in providing insights to our advocacy work. And so we, we are a, a, a voice that is embedded, a coordinated voice that is embedded in the experience of people who are providing supports and the experience of people living with mental health difficulties and their family members. Uh, this is what we want. We want an Ireland where people with mental health difficulties can recover their well-being and live a full life in the community. Simple, right? I think that's pretty straightforward. And this is, what, this is the way we do our work. This is a snapshot of the way we do our work. We always start from listening, listening to our members and their experience, listening to people with mental health difficulties through our grassroots forum, uh, and family members who are participants in the grassroots forum. And we try to take particular heed to perspectives from marginalized groups. So we have an ethnic minorities advisory group, we have a homeless sector advisory group, and we have a children's 
uh, advisory group, formerly the Children's Mental Health Coalition. We try to be solution focused in our advocacy because we do find that people listen more, people who we want to influence listen more when we can bring them solutions that they can be part of and, and, and are able to see how they can be part of. And I'll tell you how we've had positive experience of that recently. Um, and we do advise uh, government uh, uh, officials, uh, ministers, um, and uh, other public bodies. Occasionally we get noisy, occasionally we do take uh, very public uh, statements. Uh, we've had one protest. It'd be great if we never had to have a protest again, but I, I won't count on that. But we have had one, one visible protest that resulted in a 12 million euro reversal of uh, back into mental health services, so that was good. Um, and we do provide a visible voice, I think, speaking to the importance of making mental health a priority uh, in this country. Right now, uh, in terms of listening, we're running a national consultation, and I would ask each and every one of you uh, to encourage anyone who has used mental health services in the past two years, or any family member who has supported someone who uses mental health services, to please go onto our website and fill out the survey. Um, this is going to be a, a national picture of people's experience of mental health services that we will feed back to the HSE, the Minister for Mental Health, um, and the Mental Health Commission. Um, we have done work in, in developing good practice, so we, we've defined uh, a consensus statement of a recovery-orientated mental health services. We have identified unmet needs through our briefing papers for ethnic minorities and mental health. Uh, and we moved that into good practice guidance that was jointly published with the Mental Health Commission on how to embed cultural competency into mental health services. We developed um, uh, consensus positions that we submit to government. Uh, we published a, uh, under the brand of the Children's Mental Health Coalition uh, a position on child and adolescent mental health supports. Uh, and then we uh, have also demonstrated and, and sought to demonstrate uh, solutions in practice. And this is where um, we enjoy partnering with other organizations in order to bring uh, the evidence of collaboration together in something that works better for people with mental health difficulties. These are the sites of a project that we've just concluded called the Integrating Employment and Mental Health Supports Project. Um, it brought together the Department of Social Protection and its employability services, uh, directly with the HSE's mental health services, and embedded a uh, job coach within mental health teams in four locations. And uh, we were very pleased to see how uh, the Department of Social Protection was interested in supporting this, this project and, and, and co-funding it. And um, we were also pleased to see how the two systems, the health system and, and the you know, employment support system, came together and learned from each other. And everyone said that at the end of the day, the service they were able to provide was better than the service they had been providing before. And we're hopeful now that uh, this process will, through um, interest by the Department of Social Protection and the HSE, that they're looking at rolling this out nationally now, which is very exciting. We also are trying to identify innovative new ways of providing access to mental health support. We are the Irish partner for the eMen project, which is looking at how uh, e-mental health technology uh, can be used to improve Europe's mental health. And we are involved in, in, in that with the HSE in trying to roll out uh, e-mental e health technology in primary care, uh, a, an app intervention in primary care, again, on a national basis. Uh, and we're also looking at um, a game-based app and exploring how that can be embedded into mental health uh, treatment for adolescents, uh, again, um, focused on primary care setting. Uh, this, is, uh, this is me at a, somewhere I'm around the table here, at, at a youth mental health task force meeting. So all of the listening and all of the evidence that we try and gather, we then try and influence change. And um, we have 
uh, are anxiously awaiting publication of the Youth Mental Health Task Force report, which we hope will, uh, will make some uh, recommendations that will be relevant to the things we've been talking about today, particularly around things like um, counseling services in third level education, which we know are absolutely overwhelmed and which need real funding in order to uh, meet the need. Um, things like integration of adult and child and adolescent mental health services, so people, young people don't get lost through the, in the cracks between those two um, services. Uh, and things like um, uh, fixing the law on consent so that 16 and 17 year olds who um, are in mental health treatment have the same right to make decisions about their mental health care as they do currently in relation to their physical health care. Um, we also are very active in um, supporting the Oireachtas members to understand issues around mental health. And uh, in terms of the impact there, I think we must take some credit for the fact that we now have a national parliamentary committee on the future of mental health care. I think we are uh, one of the very few countries in the world that has a statutory parliamentary committee on mental health and we should be very proud of that and we're, we are actively engaged with that committee on a regular basis. Um, and then we get public and we try and make it very clear um, through our um, public campaigning that mental health has to be a priority and that real change has to happen on the ground for people who use mental health services. And uh, in, during the general election campaign in 2016, we ran our Our State of Mind campaign and we uh, were able to see that influence of highlighting the importance of mental health in all of the party manifestos where they all felt they had to speak to and make commitments on mental health. Uh, and now we're, we're busy holding them to account, aren't we? <laughs> and and uh, we're, we're seeing whether they've delivered. Uh, right now we have a, a public campaign to try and get wider access to out of hours, out of office hours support for people in a mental health crisis. Uh, the specialist mental health services in many parts of the country are only open Monday to Friday, nine to five, and people have needs that are not restricted to Monday to Friday, nine to five. So we need the services to match people's need. Uh, we have 14,000 signatures on that petition right now. So um, by le after lunch, we might have 14,050. <laughs> um, and I would just uh, encourage you uh, to, to be come and be connected. Uh, we're not just a, a coalition of organizations. We are uh, really the, the activity of everyone who's connected to mental health reform, uh, letting people know that mental health needs to be a priority in this country. Um, and uh, I know that you all in your areas of work are champions for that. Um, I found this morning really, really insightful and inspiring, and inspiring to, to me as, a, as an activist and as someone who will speak to this issue um, in a range of forms when I have the opportunity. Um, and I look forward to engaging with you in the future.